Hi, Dale. How are you? Hi, Yara. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm really good. I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you. Um, I, as I said before, I know we had crossed paths um, and I had the opportunity to hear you speak right when we were talking about the census and the importance of ensuring that there wasn't a citizenship question on the census. And as soon as I heard you speak, I located uh, the nearest law school application and I'm now looking at early applications. So thank you for that. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you for my life's Amazing. path, basically. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm excited because um, when we talked to people that about having this conversation, they submitted some of their pressing questions about this election. Uh, as we know, the election is ongoing and that November 3rd is actually the end date. But I wanted to start by bringing in some of their questions. Oh, she has a funny Instagram name. Supportive yet cynical potato asks, what's the difference between a mail-in ballot and an absentee ballot? Which there I would is... actually personally love to know myself. I know I got my mail-in ballot, but there are different options as well as a provisional ballot too, uh, when we're thinking about voting in the next couple weeks. Yeah, so what's the difference between an absentee and a mail-in ballot? There's yes. actually no difference between an absentee and a mail-in ballot. They are it's just essentially, words. They're, assent, they're two <laughs> phrases for the exact same thing. Um, seven states let everyone vote. Ex seven states have their elections almost entirely by mail. Sometimes people call those the mail-in voting states. Mm -hmm. And then this year, another 38 states let everyone who wants to either vote by mail by citing a, a traditional kind of absentee excuse or they just let everyone do it. And in some states, they just call it no excuse absentee voting. But the things are basically the same. You know, the president votes in Florida and he says, well, I do that by the absentee process. So that's OK. What I don't like are mail-in votes. But Florida has no excuse absentee voting. Anyone who wants to vote by mail in Florida can get a mail-in ballot. So there isn't really a difference between the two things. They're just two words for the same process. Mm -hmm. no, that's so good to know. Just being somebody that is always on social media, sometimes the conversations around it can make it sound so confusing and like there's a difference where there genuinely is none. Um, and then I'm wondering too, this kind of goes into some another question somebody had regarding voter intimidation. I know provisional ballot is something that we also have access to if for some reason um, whether our registration doesn't come up. And so I'm wondering if you could walk us through what a provisional ballot is and when we should access it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is a provisional ballot and when um, should you access it? Um, everyone who shows up at the polls on election day or during early voting even um, has a right to cast a ballot. Now, mm -hmm. if you're not registered, if you're not in the poll books, they're not going to give you a regular ballot. They're going to give you something called a provisional ballot to make sure that if it was a mistake on the state's part, that you can still cast something and they'll double check your registration, all your information to make sure that you are in fact eligible and should have been in the poll books. And if so, they'll count your provisional ballot. So everyone mm -hmm. under federal law, the Help America Vote Act of 2002 has a right to cast a provisional ballot. So if you show up at the polls, they say you're not in the book, um, you have a right to ask for a provisional ballot and, and to cast that ballot, and hopefully it'll be um, um, counted if all of your information checks out. Very cool. That's great to know. Um, and Carly Hogg, um, kind of along the same lines, was wondering about voter intimidation and really what one should do if there's voter intimidation at her polling place. I know a lot of people have been disseminating different numbers to access um, but is there a centralized location to figure out if you are coming across any issue at your polling place, what you should turn to? Uh, if you come across any issue at your polling place, like voter intimidation, extremely long lines, machines or poll books breaking down, the one number that I would recommend to everyone is 866-OUR-VOTE. That's 866-O-U-R-V-O-T-E, mm -hmm. our vote. It's already in it, my contacts. Yeah, um, it's the um, election protection program that's coordinated by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. It's a nonpartisan effort 
that a lot of civil rights organizations, good government groups, and even private sector lawyers volunteer their time for to respond to problems that voters encounter when they're trying to um, vote at the polls, either in during early in-person voting or on election day. Um, and mm -hmm. they just help people navigate those problems. And voter intimidation is one of those issues where if you see it happening, um, you can call that number and the folks on that line will either try to help you navigate that process or if necessary, they'll make phone calls, talk to elections administrators to try to get the problem fixed for everyone. And if the problem can't be, get fixed through that kind of advocacy, then it gets elevated up to um, lawyers like me who mm -hmm. try to solve the problem in the courts. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because as our elections have already started, I know we've already seen so many long lines, people waiting all day. And even as a, a I will be a fourth time voter myself, but voting in our primaries this year, I remember going to my polling place and there are many people who use this polling place because it's particularly accessible if you have different abilities or if you're elderly and we arrive and the poll workers couldn't locate who was designated to turn on the machines. And so, I mean, fortunately, there was a polling place nearby and we were able to put in a call to make people aware of it. But it is interesting to think of the things that you may run into. Um, and it's great to know, I think, proactively that there's resources to turn to uh, rather than panicking, knowing that there are people waiting to, to help us solve that. Um, and then I, I think really in extension of the Carly Hall question, um, we're wondering broadly what the ACLU is doing to protect against and proactively combat voter suppression in many states. We know that this is work that happens not just when an election pops up, but something that you're doing year round. Yeah, the ACLU is doing everything we can to fight back against voter suppression. And it's, as you say, Yara, it's something that is a year round task. Um, we have filed more than 25 lawsuits since the start of the pandemic. Um, in 19 states and Puerto Rico, just trying to make sure that everyone can vote safely mm -hmm. without having to make a choice between risking their health or their lives with the pandemic going on and exercising um, the right to vote. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's the first thing. We're just trying to make sure that the rules are fair and safe and accessible for everyone and that voters' health are, uh, um, is protected. Um, mm -hmm. That's one. Two, we created a 50-state guide aclu.org slash voter, um, which has the rules in all 50 states for voting early. So mm -hmm. we saw these problems you mentioned during primaries, like long lines, the problems with machines. You know, there's a poll worker shortage in a lot of places because a lot of people don't want to volunteer with the pandemic going on. Totally makes sense. Um, so we're trying to help people vote early, either in person or by mail. And the rules are different in all 50 states. So we created a 50 state guide so that people can go to our website, aclu.org slash voter and learn about the rules for either voting by mail or voting early in person. So that if you don't want to vote in person on election day, um, you don't have to. Um, mm -hmm. And then the third thing that we're doing is we're participating in that election protection program that um, I mentioned. So that if people face problems like long lines or intimidation or broken machines, um, there will be people from the ACLU and other organizations at the other end of that hotline, um, taking people's calls, trying to explain um, to people what their rights are, help them navigate through those pro problems. And um, if that's not enough, um, we'll be ready to run into court on an emergency basis and make sure that everyone who wants to vote can. Yeah, and so for the people that maybe haven't come up with a voting plan yet, accessing that guide is a great step because I know some states have rules about your ballot being postmarked at a certain time, whereas other states require the actual delivery at a certain time, and those dates are coming up quickly. So I, I have, I've made a mental note, aclu.org slash voter, right? Yes, that's, that, that, that's exactly it. And you, you mentioned making a voting plan so, so important this year. It's, you know, with the pan, when the pandemic hit and we were told that we needed to flatten the curve, make the lives of hospital workers healthcare providers um, easier. Um, same thing is true for election day. We, mm -hmm. it, as much as possible, we've try, got to try to flatten the curve so that elections administrators don't get this massive rush at the end, which results in you know mistakes, long lines, um, delays in counting the ballots. If people can vote early, um, do it. And the most important thing you can do right now is make a voting plan. 
Mm -hmm. And going to that question of delays and such, I know there's already been an ongoing conversation about the fact that this election may not look like ones we've seen in the past, where we vote and then that night we get our answers. And so I'm wondering what we can expect our election day and night to look like and really what expectations we should set for ourselves about when we should know the results. I know it's actually a priority to feel like there's time being taken to count all the mail-in ballots. You're absolutely right. This, this election may look very different from others in terms of when we get results. We've gotten so used to, as a public, like the polls closing and then you see breaking news graphics from CNN or MSNBC or whatever, and they tell you within minutes, like who won a state. But this year, it might be different because uh, there's so many more people voting by mail and um, those mail-in votes, they generally take longer to count. And some states um, have rules that don't even allow the state to start processing and verifying those ballots until election night. Um, you know, we were talking about how the, the rules for um, voting early and by mail, they differ in all 50 states and all 50 states have different rules for when they start processing ballots. Um, the three states that were kind of the decisive ones in 2016, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, they do not allow elections officials to start even looking at the absentee ballots to confirm that the information on them is accurate, that the signatures match, that all the information that needs to be there is there until election day in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania or the day before election day in Michigan. And when you have so many people voting by mail in those states, maybe 40 to 60 percent of ballots cast we're expecting this year to come in by mail in those states. Mm -hmm. um, it means we might not be, know who won them on election night. And if that's true, and if those states end up being the decisive ones again, it means we won't know who the president-elect is for a few days. Mm -hmm. It's possible we will know who won nationally because other states do process their absentee votes earlier. Florida does it on a rolling basis. So does North mm -hmm. Carolina. So does Arizona. So if the, if the election isn't close and all those states end up going for one candidate, then we might know who won the presidency. But it's, it's very possible that we won't on election night and it might mm -hmm. be days or even a week. And just to kind of go back to the ballot and for everyone who hasn't yet either early voted or is planning to vote in the upcoming days, I know for us, the presidential election has been front and center, but there's also many important decisions to be made down ballot in regards to, I mean, many conversations, especially this year about policing, about who's in charge of our educational system, judges, et cetera. And so I'm wondering, how do you suggest we approach making sure that we have all the information we need to be able to vote down ballot? You're so right that the down ballot races are so, so important. So much energy always gets sucked up and focused on the presidential election or even the top of the ticket in a state, whether it's the governor or mm -hmm. uh, an election for Senate. But the elections that most directly affect policy that in turn most directly affects people's lives, mm -hmm. criminal justice, you know, policing, mm -hmm. um, education, those decisions are made at the local level. And it's so important for people to understand what, you know, where the candidates stand on those issues at the local level and to also show up for those down ballot races, which aren't always in sync with national elections. Um, we have created a resource on down ballot elections at the ACLU. Um, the, you know, vote like your rights um, depend on it, rights for all campaign, um, where we, particularly on criminal justice issues, mm -hmm. um, set forth where candidates down ballot stand on things, whether it's like district attorneys or um, people running for other local offices that affect um, and implement criminal justice policy. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really, really, really important. It's great to see the amazing turnout that we're seeing in the, the, the presidential election this November. Already like 30 million people have voted with uh, less than two weeks left to the election. But wow. we need to see that same kind of engagement and passion and enthusiasm for local elections that aren't always in November. 
Mm -hmm. And it kind of bridges between not only this question, but kind of the final question. I know one thing that really is true to Gen Z and what's been seen throughout the course of the year, but the past couple of years, is the importance of this broader fight for equity. We've seen over, whether it be a hundred days of consistent protest, people utilizing their voices in different sectors, whatever industry they may be in. And so um, I think the first part of the question is, how do we ensure that our values and what uh, what we care about is reflected in our choices when we vote? Is it by accessing that voter guide? Um, how do we, I think, as young people developing our political opinion, uh, do that in a way that isn't necessarily reactive, but proactive? Um, and then really going on to what you've already touched on, what does civic engagement look like on a daily basis? We know that uh, election day is not an end date, but in many ways a start date. And you've already said it's important to hold our elected officials accountable well after the election. And so I'm wondering if you could give us any tips and tricks as to how we should be doing that. I mean, that's a great question. You know, John Lewis was fond of saying that democracy is not a state, but an act, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just an act on election day every two or four years. It's a constant practice. Mm -hmm. And civic engagement is so much more than just filling out a ballot, which I know is important. And, and, and I don't mean to say that it's not. Obviously, it is. And this election is so, so, so important. But it's so... Uh, important to not just vote, but to stay civically engaged after the election, to make sure that elected officials who ran on platforms like criminal justice reform, like attacking mm -hmm. um, systemic racism, like ending this administration's um, xenophobic anti-immigrant policies, that they mm -hmm. stay true to those promises. And that means, you know, everything that people do in terms of calling their elected officials, you know, sending letters, but also just mass civic participation. The protests this summer, I feel like they gave me so much hope about mm -hmm. how engaged people are right now and where we are as, and where we, where we want to be as a country, not where we are, but where we can <laughs> get. And it's not just, it's not going to be just voting that gets us there. I mean, the lawsuits that we bring, I don't think we win those lawsuits a lot of the time without the support of people in the streets, making their voices heard, elevating issues, getting the media's attention. Um, all of these things are so important. It's not just voting and it's not just law. It's, mm -hmm. it's activism um, 24 seven, 365 days out of the year. Yeah, well, that's a, a wonderful note to end on, especially as we get ready for the, this next beginning and this next kind of surge of uh, civic engagement. And I'm wondering, of course, we can go to ACLU.org, but if there's any other places where we can make sure that we're following the work that you're doing, especially since there's so much happening post-election. There is so much happening and it is dizzying. Um, <laughs> I think our website's a good place, as good a place as any to get updates on the work that the ACLU is doing. Um, there are other great organizations that are also doing um, um, fabulous voting rights work, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, definitely check out what they're doing because um, mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big group effort. The best way to keep up with what the ACLU is doing in real time is to follow us on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, just at ACLU. Um, we're always posting breaking news and keeping people up to date on what we're mm -hmm. doing on voting rights, on immigrants' rights, on LGBTQ rights, everything that the ACLU does um, as soon as there's news about it. Um, we tweet about it. Okay, great. I'm already following, but for everyone watching, that is a must follow, um, especially as we approach election day. <laughs> <laughs>